Community Connections CPMS Local sounds, thoughts, passions, and success Celebrate local Your neighbor's got a story to tell Community Connections Happy Monday, Waterloo Region. It is the 22nd of May, 2023. It is Victoria Day in the Dominion of Canada. And I'm just curious how long we're going to be celebrating a queen that's been dead for some 120 years. Probably time we started celebrating Queen Elizabeth or maybe even King Charles. Of course, it might be even better to celebrate something that doesn't link us to our colonialist past. But that's a conversation for another day. I want to remind you of the petition that is going on for um, queer, lesbian, gay, trans people to um, be provided refugee access to Canada from what are normally considered safe third countries. You remember that Kate Glasson was in to see us back in February. That petition is coming due in about four days on the 26th of May. So if you haven't signed that yet, go do that. You'll find the links on the Radio Waterloo website, radiowaterloo.ca slash ccc. Look for the show from the 19th of February with Kate Glasson. Have that link in today's show notes as well. Got in the studio with me, Jim Stewart from the Waterloo Region Health Coalition. Good morning, Jim. Good to have you in the studio again. It probably, probably means that there are bad things happening in the world. Jim will tell us all about the things that they're advocating for in a few minutes. Right now, we're listening to a track called Eve by Stunt Double. That's Zar, who was in the studio with us last week. It's just called Generic Hip Hop Folder. That's Eve by Stunt Double, native of KW. That's our KW content for today. I have in the studio with me Jim Stewart from the Waterloo Region Health Coalition. Good morning, Jim. Good morning, Bob. Have been keeping up, but if you're in the studio, it means that uh, all is not well with public health in Ontario. Mm-hmm. All is definitely not well. Yeah. Can you uh, bring us up to date on what's happened? You were in on, on February, I believe. Yes, and, uh, I was. Uh, on Family Day, so now we're mm-hmm. here on Victoria Day. Seems like right. we have the holidays reserved for you, Jim. And we have a tradition. Thank you for that. <laughs> uh, yes, Bob, let me uh, first of all start by talking about what we're doing this coming weekend, this coming Friday and Saturday. That's uh, May 26th and 27th. We are holding across the province, so this is a province-wide citizen-led referendum on the privatization of our core hospital services. Many people are shocked when they find out that the Ford administration is actually moving ahead with their plan to take 50% of all of our core surgical services that are performed in our public hospitals and move them out to profit-driven private clinics. So we think that's an egregious type of action and that there is absolutely no mandate for that type of uh, strategy and the fact that most people in Ontario are completely unaware of it is something that we, is the actual reason for the referendum. This is not something that um, 
Mr. Ford or anybody else from the Progressive Conservative Government of Ontario you know, um, promised in their election campaign? No, quite the reverse. What happened, and I brought along into the studio today a printout from a, a publication, a, a copy of the publication, the records publication, our major newspaper mm -hmm. yeah. locally, uh, about a year ago, on March 17th, uh, actually, a little over a year ago, we had uh, raised the alarm because we had information, leaked information about this privatization uh, approach, this policy by the Ford government. And so what we did is we leaked that information to the press. And we got quite a lot of coverage all across the province of Ontario on this, where we talked about privatization. And in, and I'm just going to read to you verbatim what the Minister of Health spokesperson at the time said after we had captured via CBC TV a recording, a video recording of the then uh, Minister of Health, Christine Elliott, saying that they were going to privatize, expand independent health facilities, which is a euphemism for, public, uh, for private uh, clinics, mm -hmm. and, and private hospitals. We thought that was shocking. It was a bombshell. So we leaked that information. And then their spokesman said the following. These claims are categorically false. To be clear, the government is committed to supporting the province's public health care system. The use or function of private hospitals and independent health facilities in Ontario is not being expanded or changed. So... That's verbatim from the Minister of Health. When, when was that announcement made? That was March 17th, 2022, just at the lead up to the provincial election. Mm -hmm. And then they continued to tell the same story all the way through the pre-election uh, media uh, scrums that there was not going to be any privatization. They repeated that message over and over again all across the province. And then, of course, they win the election, and just eight weeks after they win the election, they come out and say, oh, I'm sorry, the status quo is not working. We're pouring millions of dollars into public health care, and uh, we can't keep up. And consequently, we are absolutely going to move 50%, 50% of all of our core public service, public hospital surgeries and diagnostic services to profit-driven private clinics. And that was around December of 2022? When they made that statement, it was yeah. in August of, of 2022. August. Yes, just eight weeks after the oh, election. Oh, my goodness. Yes, and so what we're, what we're seeing here is a complete U-turn. So at one yeah. point leading up to the election, the Ford administration is saying they're not going to privatize, and then right after the election, they do a complete reverse reversal and state that they are now actively... Uh, going towards privatization but it gets worse because the other thing that occurred that we found out through the uh, financial accountability office is that exactly at the time when they were denying that they were going to move ahead with privatization they were doubling the funding to independent health facilities yeah. so the financial accountability office is the nonpartisan accounting body at queen's park that all the parties use and it provides clear and undisputed evidence about that financial move transferring all these funds and it was not insignificant what it meant was that about a, on uh, that the Ford government came became on track to, to spend over a hundred million dollars every year on independent health facilities mm -hmm. and this was before their announcement mm -hmm. so we believe that the government actually lied they denied what they were doing, and yet they had a plan all along, and now we're seeing the fruits of that plan, and we're disgusted by it. Yeah. I think that as, as recently as December of 2022, which is why I mentioned it, uh, there were still claims by the Minister of Health that there was no privatization plan at all. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, there's been all kinds of claims back and forth, but they were very consistent during the election period yeah. of uh, denying that there was going to be any privatization and then uh, keeping incredibly silent throughout the entire election process. I and mean, when we had invited them to all candidates' meetings, et cetera, and they wouldn't show up. Yeah. The conservatives wouldn't show up. And that was pretty typical right across the province. Yes. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is that because this, this mandate that Mr. Ford talks about uh, has a number of different uh, considerations that we really have to get into. Number one, 
they don't have a mandate because they didn't ask the, po the, the, the population of Ontario what they thought about privatizing the core hospital services that we've built and paid for over the last hundred years, something that we all cherish, and replacing it with a profit-driven reality. We do not want American-style health care. And quite frankly, I think if Mr. Ford had asked that question, he would have got a resounding no. So that's why we're having the referendum on Friday and Saturday, and we really hope that people come out and vote. And we also are asking for volunteers to help us with this. But the second thing that I want to talk to you about is that we don't actually even need to do this, this, this privatization thing. What Mr. Ford is not saying is incredibly important. He's not saying that we've got a capacity in our existing operating rooms for over 100,000 surgeries. So, for instance, uh, they're talking about running, uh, uh, running cataract surgeries now. Yes. In, that's the first step. They're running cataract surgeries. They want to get 14,000 cataract surgeries uh, delivered via private clinics. But we don't need to do that. Most people are unaware of the fact that we've got operating rooms that close at 3 or 4 o'clock yeah. in the afternoon. And if we would just simply run, our, and each operating room can do about two cataract surgeries in an hour, so if we simply uh, ran our surgeries, uh, our operating rooms for an extra two hours a day, you know, and every day, Monday to Friday, five days a week, and we'll say we used 50 operating rooms across the province to do that, we could take care of that 14,000 surgeries in 14 weeks. We'd be able to do 1,000 a week. And, so, and, and yet we get the hospitals overflowing with um, hallway health care, you know, people not having uh, access to rooms, uh, emergency rooms overflowing because there's, there's not enough staff to take care of trauma units and the like. So even though the operating rooms are available, I don't think the staffing uh, is available because the funding is lacking. That's precisely it. So the funding has been restricted and quite frankly when we talk about the funding of our public health care system what Mr. Ford is also not talking about is that he underspent on our public health care budget by 900 million dollars last fiscal year mm -hmm. so that was 900 million dollars that was already budgeted for public health care that wasn't spent and now with their new budget that they've come out with there we are looking at a shortfall of five billion dollars that's with a b five billion dollars by 2024 and it gets worse and, th and what i mean by that is that if you look at that those projections by again the fao the financial accountability office mm -hmm. and comparing the numbers that the financial accountability office think is important for health care over the next five years against the ford budget we're looking at a 21.3 billion dollar shortfall over the next the, these next five years, yeah. that's shocking. That's destructive. That's dismantling everything that we've bought and paid for, and we don't need to do it. And it's more expensive. So, in in the last term of office, they had money budgeted but didn't spend it on health care. Correct. And this year, they're not even budgeting that amount. They're just creating a shortfall because money is allegedly not available. That's that's right. There's a complete shortfall of five billion dollars by the end of by by 2024 when we get there. So five ta billion. My, ta my taxes is, have not gone down at all. No. Uh, where is all this money going, or where where has it been redirected to? Well, I believe, you know, and it's really difficult to to get the clear information now because with the new bill called Bill 60, and I'd like to talk to you about that <laughs> in some detail if you don't mind. Well, go ahead. But. Well, before we get there, let's just talk about uh, where the money is going. Well, f now with Bill 60 is law in the province of Ontario. This is the privatization of our hospital services bill mm -hmm. act. It's now law. Yes. And with that law, what's happened is that there, the information is now protected from freedom of information reports and requests because the money is flowing through a private agency. And that is really incredibly harmful. It's, it eliminates all our transparency. It's secretive. And people did not approve of that either. And again, that's something else that Mr. Ford has not discussed. So the things he hasn't discussed was, one, that they were going to privatize. Mm -hmm. 
two, that it was going to cost a lot more, and three, that they were going to dismantle our public health care services, and four, that they were going to transfer all our surgeries, 50% of, of our surgeries, out of our hospitals, and then MRIs and CT scans as well. And lock it all up in secrecy and, legislation. And lock it all up in secrecy legislation with Bill 60. Yeah. It's disgusting. It is certainly not what I voted for. No, I don't think anybody would have voted for that because it's just anti-democratic. Yeah. I mean, in our country, what we anticipate from our elected officials is clarity, transparency, and, you know, for them to be good stewards of our public finances. And this doesn't even make financial sense. And I'll talk to you about that yeah, right yeah. now, if you yeah. don't mind. So I, I just want to talk about accountability first. I mean, okay. um, this is these are things that are happening that are obviously uh, obvious to me at any rate, bad for uh, the public of Ontario. Uh, how do we hold the government accountable for the harm that they're doing? Well, I mean, we don't really have a lot of options because uh, despite the fact that every single uh, opposition party, the Greens, the NDP and the Liberals, all voted against Bill 60, against that mm -hmm. act, in the legislature, they have a, a, a majority government, so they were able to move yeah. ahead. The PCs have the majority government. The PCs yes. have a majority government, so they were able to move ahead. Despite that, we had an opportunity during committee on committee hearings on Bill 60 to voice our concerns, and we provided the government of Ontario with 64 recommendations about uh, and changes to the act yeah. that we felt would bring it more in line with what the government, of, uh, the people of Ontario, would like to see happen. Yeah. And of course, true to form, the Ford administration didn't accept a single recommendation from the, the stakeholders, like ourselves, the Ontario Health Coalition, like the Ontario Nurses Association, like the uh, Ontario Medical Association, uh, and many other. St uh, stakeholders, Canadian Federation of University Women, put together a, a very interesting, you know, report on on on, on that bill, mm -hmm. and so there's all kinds of people with very strong and powerful, good arguments against it, and and made, and offered many excellent changes, but none of it was accepted. So where does that leave us? It leaves us with our referendum on Friday and Saturday, and we again hope everybody will come out and vote. Yeah. We are not Elections Canada. This is a massive undertaking for a volunteer-led organization like the Health Coalition. So we believe that getting a million votes across the province will send a absolute strong and clear message to Mr. Ford. And reality is, the reality is that if he didn't have a mandate to do this and he did a complete sea change after post-election, that is wrong on every single level, all meaningful levels, yeah. and it can't go unchallenged. So what we're doing with the referendum is also challenging that position that the government has, give, uh, has taken without, you know, going ahead with privatization without our endorsement whatsoever as the yeah. public uh, uh, and, and the people of Ontario. Yeah. You've been going out to various um, MPPs' offices to do the pop-up pickets and the like. What sort of reception have you had from the individual uh, members of provincial parliament? Well, I mean, we hear the same talking points from the uh, uh, progressive conservatives that we hear from Mr. Ford, which is things are not working, and it's costing too much money, and you'll just be able to pay with your OHIP card, which is a pack of lies, all of it. Mm -hmm. And then what we're hearing from the opposition uh, parties, you know, the Liberals, the NDP, and the Greens, is that they're fully supportive of what we're trying to fight against, and they're completely against privatization. So we're seeing two completely divergent points of view. And, of course, being um, in the minority, for all the opposition parties being in the minority, they haven't got the voice in the legislature to get their views uh, actually recognized and passed in legislation. That's correct. You know, with our parliamentary system, what happens is the majority government, the majority party in government gets to do whatever they want, yeah. and that's what they're doing. So it's really easy to blame the voters. I mean, we had really poor voter turnout, 43 44% voter turnout, and it turns out that the number of um, eligible voters that voted for the Conservatives is only about 18%. 17.8%. Yeah, and so that's, they are granted a majority government, uh, the most seats 
in the legislature with only 17.8 percent of the votes. Yes, you're making a very strong case for proportional representation, yeah. uh, <laughs> which is something that you know we are considering as well, as supporting as well. But back to the reality on the ground, I mean, I think it's really important for people to understand what's actually happening with their OHIP uh, paid services. So we have OHIP covered services that are going to be transferred from our hospitals to these private clinics. And Mr. Ford is saying that, hey, you can just pay with your OHIP card. You won't have to pay anything else. But I don't believe, and I don't think anybody in Ontario believes, that a profit-driven private clinic isn't going to find a really excellent and innovative way to charge you. And in fact, you know, we've just won a couple of cases, like the Canby case was just defeated in the Supreme Court of Canada over double billing. But even though... Can you just review that a little bit? Cause sure. I, I remember there being double billing yeah. um, conversations maybe 20 years ago. Yeah. Has that only finally come through the courts it, now? It's just it's very recent in the last uh, month or so. So what happened was in British Columbia there was a, a clinic providing uh, surgical services and that clinic wanted to double bill patients, the idea being that this would help with the wait lists in the province of British Columbia. And so they went ahead and, and, went, and went right through that and did that, and they, they were billing to the tune of $500,000 a month in additional, uh, in additional fees. So the, the Health Coalition in British Columbia and the opposition parties in British Columbia said, uh, not the opposition, the actual government of British Columbia, and I'm sorry, it just escapes me which party it was now, but, you know, we'll get that information to you if you need it. Yeah. The point is that uh, the government of uh, British Columbia said, sorry, that's not on. We're not going to allow you to do that. So they went to court, and the Canby Clinic lost. They appealed it to the Supreme Court of British Columbia and lost again. But they weren't uh, finished there. They went to the Supreme Court of Canada. And, of course, they've got all kinds of backing from, like, major, you know, U.S. healthcare corporations stand to win big time in, in, in Canada mm -hmm. with, with respect to making a ton of money from our Canadian healthcare system. And they went to the Supreme Court of Canada, and fortunately for everyone, the Supreme Court of Canada said, no, you've just lost twice. You do not have standing we are not listening to this again, and it was a defeat for the Canby uh, Clinic okay. again. So that, that's where it's at. But it seems like Mr. Ford hasn't really learned any kind of lessons there about double billing or anything like that. So what they're saying is that they're going to move these services out. It's going to be an innovative strategy, but it really won't be because part of, of the new Act, Act Number 60, the Your mm -hmm. Health Care Act yeah. is what it's called, uh, is asking, inviting these private clinics to create a plan where they can co-mingle covered OHIP services with uncovered private services. So people paying their way to get preferential service. That's right. And, and it's not just that. It makes it incredibly difficult to, from an accounting perspective, to track and uncover how much additional and unnecessary services are being billed to patients in these private clinics compared to what should be covered in our public mm -hmm. hospitals for free. So we have heard, I've actually had an 81-year-old man call me up and complain that he just got his cataract surgeries uh, done and it cost him uh, $8,000. Oh for goodness. cataract surgery, and he is annoyed by that, and he wants to know if he can get his money back. <laughs> and quite frankly, there's no mechanism anywhere to do this. Now, Mr. Ford is saying that they've got, in the legislation there's all kinds of regulatory features to sort of charge people for, for double billing and extra billing when they shouldn't, but there's no mechanism within the bill. There's no policing of, of that within the bill. So That's we don't... Probably, probably by design. Yes, and so we don't see that it be likely that anybody would get their money back, even though, you know, they could, I guess, you know, complain to the Minister yeah. of Health. Is there any way to avoid those extra unnecessary billings? Yes. All you have to do is say, is this medically necessary? And if it's not med medically necessary under the Canada Health Act, then you don't have to pay for it, period. 
Mm -hmm. So we would encourage people to ask if this is a medically necessary procedure because there's all kinds of additional testing that they might f mm -hmm. feel like doing for cataract surgery. They might say, well, you know, you could, you could have this lens, but quite frankly, we think this other more, far more expensive lens that we're going right. to charge you for would be better for you, Mr. or Mrs. Patient. And the fact uh, and we're going to do a, a different kind of surgical technique, even though there's no d change in the outcomes. We're going to potentially use lasers rather yeah. than a standard surgical procedure that won't make any difference, but it costs you a lot more money. So at the end of the day, you, if you're just a, a regular person going to see an eye surgeon about you know what's best for your eyes, which is really important, and he says this stuff or she says this to you, what do you think you're going to do? Now, I'm no medical professional myself, so I'm likely to believe what I'm being told by the doctor that has been chosen to, to treat me. Precisely. Yeah. That's exactly what's going to happen. That is what's happening. And it's been happening for, uh, for quite a while now because we've had these private clinics up and running. I wonder if um, any of these additional medical procedures have been tested long enough or have been in, in practice long enough that you can compare the outcomes of um, those procedures compared to the traditional procedures that were covered under OHIP? Well, I mean, I can't speak precisely to that question, but what I can say to you is that there has been a number of studies comparing publicly delivered services like cataracts mm -hmm. and like other surgeries to private delivery. And in private delivery, you have to understand they're there to make a profit. Oh, yeah. And how do they make a profit? They make a profit by cutting corners. That's how they shave off the, the, the money and put it in their pocket. Yeah. And so one of the things they do is they use less skilled staff, and I'll get to that in a minute. Cool. And they also take only the easiest case, cases. So unfortunately what that means for our public hospitals is that all of the financial resources that we get going into our public hospitals with all of these surgeries will be transferred. All those financial resources will be transferred to, to private clinics, but also the human resources, the nurses and the doctors right. and everything, they're all going to go, go there. So what are our, what's going to happen to our public hospitals is that they'll be even more underfunded and there'll be even less staffed. There'll be it's a more of a staffing issue. And they'll be left with all of the most difficult to manage, the highest acuity cases. That's just unfair. Well, and so Not just unfair, but it's going to definitely decrease good outcomes. Well... It probably won't because in our hospital we've got uh, in our hospitals we've got you know very expert people there who okay. can deal with those types of cases. Unlike the private clinics, because if something happens in a private clinic, what do they do? They phone nine one one. Yeah. Okay. And you know we have and and uh, just to to finish my thought there. So there's all kinds of papers looking at outcomes between private delivery and and, and public delivery and public delivery wins hands down every single time. We actually saw some of that with the long-term care disaster at the beginning of COVID, where the uh, municipal uh, long-term care homes that were publicly funded and publicly managed had far better outcomes and a far lower death rate than the privately run clinics or the privately run long-term care homes. That's correct. I mean, it's identical. So what we're doing is we're not learning from that disaster in long-term care, the privatization of long-term care. Mm -hmm. And now Mr. Ford is pressing ahead with the privatization of our hospital services. So there's a couple of things in this new act that I really have to get to because you're, okay. you're, you know, your listeners have to know what's happening with Bill 60. And basically one of the things that I find most egregious here is, well, there's a number of things, is the fact that they have now, they're going to replace a Ministry of Health individual who would oversee independent health facilities with a private uh, individual or corporation. So they're no longer covered by the uh, conflict of interest issues around working for the government. They're no longer covered by the transparency that is, uh, comes with being a ministry employee. And there's no consideration for you know, corruption and how that would deal with, be dealt with in this scenario where you've got a private individual or a private corporation running all of the private clinics as the director of private clinics. So we think that is just terrible right from the get-go. And so that's one thing. The other thing, 
and we were just talking about this, is that the Act has broadened the definition of what a physician, a nurse, nurse practitioner, lab technician, radiology techno technologist, or other health professionals. With the descriptor, it says it could be either a physician or a nurse, etc., or another prescribed person. So no regulatory designations, no, you know, you know, nursing practices that they have to abide by or any anything like that. They can literally anybody be anybody without a medical degree they could, could be, be the prescribed a person. Prescri to a prescribed person in the act. Oh. And what would that do? That would cheapen the cost of labor for private delivery, yes. right? So it brings down the cost of labor, allows them to make a lot more money. And you know, at Queen's Park there's been there's now 1,037 health care cons uh, lobbyists at Queen's Park. That's an unconscionable number of lobbyists on health care. And they're, again... All of whom get paid. They all get the paid. Private, privatization um, profits. Well, I mean, the companies that stand, the American health care companies and Canadian health care companies, and mostly American, the Canadian, unfortunately, Canadian health, uh, insurance companies... Uh, you've got think tanks like the Fraser Institute, ultra right wing think tanks who mm -hmm. think that we should have market driven everything, yeah. a market driven healthcare system like they have in America, like in the USA, yeah. which the Americans despise. Yes. So we are going to go towards something that the Americans are trying to leave behind. The Americans would like to have something that similar to what we have, yeah. which is a, a healthcare system based on compassion. Sadly, again, the yeah. people in charge uh, in the U.S. healthcare system are doing the same thing that the government of Ontario is trying to do here. So, you know, it's the people themselves may be opposed to privatization, yeah. but the politicians seem to be in favor for some reason. Well, again, it's back to this idea of the lobbyists. You yeah. know, what do these lobbyists actually do with the politicians at Queen's Park? So many of them, and uh, they're spending a hell of a lot of money doing what? influencing our, our, our political party, the Ford administration, and driving yeah. them to make decisions like privatizing our core health care yeah. services, so which nobody wants. Assuming that there's no out-and-out -out bribery taking place there, what's in it for the politician to pay attention to these lobbyists? Well, I think it's just, you know, they, they, get, they hear the same message from the lobbyists over and over again, and they're sold on the concept continually these are very smooth operators that have a very compelling way of talking about how a private delivery system could be more innovative and that's just not true yeah. and, 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 and it costs that, more and, and it guess costs more to do it in a private delivery system too if you know I talked earlier about the the amount of uh, operation operational capacity that we have but maybe just locally you'd be surprised to know that at Grand River Hospital We've got 10 operating rooms, but three of them are closed. Yeah. And at St. Mary's Hospital, we've got eight operating rooms, but two of those are closed. Yeah. So we've got all the infrastructure. We've got all the well-trained people we need. It costs less because to do precisely the same surgery, let's just talk about cataracts, and then I'll talk about hips and knees, But because that's the second yeah, yeah. phase. Mm -hmm. So with cataract surgery, to deliver that care, in a public hospital in Ontario, it costs approximately $400. That's the procedural fee that OHIP pays the hospital to deliver one cataract surgery. But And that, and that covers and that, the, the surgeon, the anesthetist, the uh, operating, nurse, operating room nurses, uh, supplies. Not quite, but there's something called facility fees that are also ah, okay. uh, delivered with each procedure, and I'll talk about that too. Okay. But... From a procedural fee perspective, doing the same thing in a private clinic with the same hospital, uh, the same sorry, the same uh, physician, is going to cost six hundred and five dollars. So about two hundred and five dollars more to do precisely the same thing from a procedural fee perspective. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned uh, facility fees. So the hospitals receive facility fees to cover maintenance, administration, and support services for the operational operating, operating rooms. Now those facility fees, which are typically more than double what the total procedural fees are for any given hospital okay. in any given year, those facility fees are now going to go to the private clinics. Begging the question again, 
how private are these private clinics when we are paying for them and we're paying more to do exactly the same thing so that somebody can get incredibly wealthy? Yeah. I've heard it said that um, because the privatization of healthcare is entirely for profit, uh, it means that any additional or just any health care expenditures are going to reduce the profit and uh, aren't going to happen because it's, it affects the bottom line. So yeah. you're, you're, you're losing health care expenditure or, or spending on health care outcomes in order to increase profit. Well, I mean, that's what a profit-driven yeah. system is all about, increasing profit. They're not there to deliver good care. They're there to make a profit and deliver to good care if they can. But the evidence is that they cannot deliver as good uh, care, level of care, as good an outcome as, they, as we could get in our public system. But just to go on with this, these procedural fees, these additional premiums on just on cataracts amount in the province of Ontario, if you look at all the cataracts that are done, mm-hmm amount to 30.7 additional million dollars every year. So 30.7 million dollars in addition. And that's to just, do those this, are the additional procedural fees that's right. for private clinics. That's, that's that $200 I was talking about, uh, times all the many thousands okay. of cataracts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's 30.7 uh, additional millions of dollars that we're paying for private delivery. Now, when we look at hips and knees, it's astounding because hips and knees cost in a public hospital about twenty uh, uh, ten thousand five hundred dollars ten thousand five hundred dollars to do a hip or a knee in a public hospital on average a, a far more complex operation much more complex operation much more dangerous too yeah. and in a in a private clinic the, those procedural fees are, are have j- been jacked up to twenty to twenty eight thousand dollars so that's about a fifteen thousand dollar surcharge on the procedural fees alone and if you multiply that out by all the joint procedures, hips and knees across the province of Ontario, it's an eye-popping $600 million in wow. procedural premiums alone. So you just take those, just those two types of surgeries alone, cataracts and, and joint surgeries, you're looking at $630 million more just on the procedural fees. And, that, and now we're not even yeah. talking about the facility fees that are also being transferred into these private clinics. And one last point about Bill 60, we will never know how much is being transferred in facility fees and procedural fees into these private clinics because, again, since they're operating as a private clinic, they are outside of the Ministry of Health's requirements for freedom of information as well. So now they're protected from freedom of information. So it's public money being transferred at a massive level to private clinics so they can make a lot of money and charge patients hundreds of thousands of dollars, maybe yeah. millions of dollars, untold numbers of dollars. And, and all, all the accountability and transparency is gone. Is gone, right. So yeah. that, again, is just dead wrong, and we are against that. Yeah. Well, people need to speak up and, and make their voices heard. So I think you've got something about that. Um, I'd like to take a, a quick break. There's a, an appropriate uh, song title here called Oh My by uh, CX Violet, who will be coming into the studio in a, in a few weeks. So uh, let's have a, a quick listen to that, and we'll be back with Jim Stewart from the Waterloo Region Health Coalition in just a bit. City's on fire If it bleeds, then it leads If it feeds, then you fire Check the lights, house is on fire If you loved us, then you leave If you leave, you're alive Check the lights, phone is blowing up If you need me, I'm a ghost Bless my mama, call me up Check the lights, boy, is growing up Spent the summer playing stages You'll be home soon enough
That's CX Violet and the new people. Uh, we'll see CX Violet in the studio in a bit. Uh, right now in the studio is Jim Stewart from the Waterloo Region Health Coalition, who's been telling us all about the horrors of the privatization of healthcare. But he has a plan. What's your plan, Jim? Well, our plan is to resist this, not to let it go unchallenged, as I mentioned earlier. And so we, we are holding a citizen led referendum on Friday and Saturday, this coming Friday the 26th and Saturday the 27th. Yeah where we'll have ballots, ballot boxes and ballots set up all across the region. And I've got a listing here of all of the different polling stations that we have it in Cambridge, in Water, City of Waterloo, the City of Kitchener, and in four of, four of the townships. So uh, we're feeling pretty strongly that if we can get enough people in our region to support this and we can add our voices to all of the other voices across the province because again this is province-wide yeah. every city in the province from you know from Thunder Bay to Cornwall from Niagara Falls to Timmins we're doing this all the major centers Toronto here London all the way down to southwestern Ontario everybody is doing the same yeah. thing we're working tremendously hard in order, to, in order to bring this off. And as I mentioned, we are a volunteer-driven organization. We don't get paid anything at the Waterloo Region Health Coalition. And consequently, you know, uh, holding a referendum of this size to, to send the appropriate message to Mr. Ford is a massive undertaking. So we need help, and, uh, we, but we desperately need your vote. So we'd like you to come out and vote. And I'm going to read, if you don't mind, what our ballot question is because I'm holding up in the studio right now one of our ballots. It's a paper ballot. Mm -hmm. You'll be able to fill this out and deposit it in one of our ballot boxes. And then we'll count up all of the ballots and uh, we'll report to Queen's Park on Monday of next week, uh, you know, what, what, what the outcome is across Ontario. So the ballot question is the following, in quotes. Do you want our public hospital services to be privatized to for-profit hospitals and clinics? Yes or no? That's pretty straightforward. Uh, pretty a very straightforward. clear question. Yes. And uh, a very clear answer to that question as well. Right. So we really hope that people come and take uh, five minutes of their time to voice their concerns over privatization. We really hope people vote no, but uh, they're entitled to vote yes as well if they mm -hmm. want to. Yeah. And again, we'll have these uh, polling stations across every city. In Waterloo, for instance, we'll have a major center at the Waterloo Town Square as well as at down the street at the First United Church. Uh, in Kitchener, we, we've, got one, we've got them all over the place from the working center to uh, Unifor's union office to Food Basics on, on Ottawa and Lackner Plaza. And, I, and I, we've yeah. got about, and in, and in Cambridge, 
We've got them uh, all over the place from Dream City play, uh, 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 Pizza in Preston to uh, in Galt, the Rookery Books and Isla the Exa Islamic Center has been very supportive, as well as uh, Fashion History Museum in Hespler. So we're covering Cambridge quite effectively as well. And then in the townships of, in New Dundee, we've got Dundee Pottery in Baden, St. James Lutheran Church, in Heidelberg, St. Peter's. Evangelical Lutheran Church and then St. Jacob, St. James's Lutheran Churches. I have to give a great shout out to the Lutheran Churches, uh, being, of being so incredibly supportive across the region yeah. to help to help us with this. Now, if you're looking for your own local uh, polling station, you can go to the website publichospitalvote.ca and click on the link to find your polling stations. I'm looking at the map right now, and you'll see it on YouTube Live if. Uh, you're yep. logged into that. It looks like Waterloo Region is really quite densely populated with polling stations. Well, that, that's a good thing. I mean, we were hoping to get as many polling stations as possible, but uh, it's <laughs> it has been quite the challenge uh, getting polling stations. Uh, many businesses didn't want to participate because they felt somehow it would be too political, but we yeah. think that uh, public health care is something that benefits everyone, including our uh, you know, including people who work in the, in the in the private sector, obviously, and so uh, we were kind of surprised by some of the resistance that we received. So it's taken us over a month to put together all of these polling stations and to uh, solicit their the support from you know a variety of disparate types of organizations across the region. But we've been successful. But however, it's taken a small army of volunteers to get this done so far. How big is the Water Region Health Coalition? How many active members? Well, it kind of comes and goes, you know, like every <laughs> other volunteer organization. Yeah. I mean, we have a contact list in the many hundreds. But uh, our, our, but the, the core people, I would say, that really get involved are about 50 people that are constantly there, constantly fighting for public health care, and constantly challenging, you know, some of these decisions that are made by the, by the Ford administration and, and advocating for something else. Like, there is an alternative, a fully resilient, well-funded public hospital system it would give us better outcomes and it would cost us less yes. to deliver, cost us less. And so financially, it makes even better sense. But, but it's never discussed. It simply is never discussed. Yeah. And we think that's wrong, too. That's something that we should really bring uh, uh, forward. And we will actively be bringing that forward, that there are options out there. You know, when Mr. Ford talks about the status quo, what he's also not talking about is that he has delivered a status quo where Ontario is dead last when it comes to overall per capita funding compared to every other province, mm. Newfoundland, Saskatchewan pay more per uh, as a GDP per, a percentage than than we do, yeah. and and not just a per capita percentage than we do, in and Ontario. that's seen in the number of hospital beds per capita. Yes, <laughs> that we we are on not just um, underpaying our healthcare services, but our healthcare services are lacking because of that lack of. That's right. We're, we are literally dead last again in the number of beds per capita yeah. in Ontario compared to every other province. And we're dead last in the number of nurses per capita yes. compared to every other province. So that's the status quo that Mr. Ford has driven us down to. This is now he's in his fifth year of, uh, of, of governance. And, and this is his responsibility. He has created this level of status quo, and I think it's incumbent upon Mr. Ford to fix it. And all it would take is for us to reach the average of all of the other ho uh, provinces across the country, and we'd be uh, much farther ahead uh, And to get rid of all of our surgical backlogs. We could yeah. do precisely what we did when we came out of COVID, where we we had additional funding for more surgeries, and we opened up our ORs more extensively and got rid of the COVID backlog yeah. almost immediately. We could do the same thing today. It's well, easy to do that. All it takes is political will and funding. And the money is there, and it shouldn't be directed to private clinics when we have a better option, a much better option that we have bu built and paid for over the last 100 years. Yeah. So we can make our political views on this known through the referendum. Absolutely. A friend of mine once said, paraphrasing, that uh, people don't think of public health as a political issue, or they do think of it as a political issue. 
But if you're not part of the political solution, then you're part of the health care problem. Ah, good point. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, we really need people to demonstrate their displeasure by voting. Yeah. Okay, so again, the referendum, citizen-led. We right. hope to send an incredibly powerful message. I mean, to give you some context, when the government receives a petition, for instance, you mentioned petition earlier, uh, a petition of about 20,000 signat signatures is a massive, massively big petition at Queen's Park. Yes. So delivering a million votes, hard copy votes, or electronic votes, because you can vote electronically, is, uh, is the way to go. And as you mentioned earlier, if you want to vote electronically, a virtual vote, you can do it at publichospitalvote.ca. Right. We'll have all those links on our show notes page, radiowaterloo.ca slash ccc. And I hope you have some of your literature available that we can post on the website there as well. Certainly link to it. Sure. Because uh, it's probably on the um, Ontario Health Coalition yeah. website as well. Or I'll send it to you if yeah. you like. That would be great. Yes. <laughs> okay. yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, the the okay. less clicking people have to do to find the information, sure. the that easier it is for everybody. Yep. That makes absolute sense. Yeah. Well, well, I just want to throw a small monkey wrench into the works here. Yes. This is um, a referendum that's been put on by the Ontario Health Coalition right. and, and a bunch of other associate organizations like the... Um, uh, Labor the Council. Labor Council, yeah. Right. The, um, the Canadians.org. Uh, uh, Council of Canadians. Co Council of Canadians. Yes. Uh, they've been uh, involved in that. Have the been ONA, uh, yeah. Unifor, all the major union groups are behind this. Uh, we have the Canadian Federation of University Women supporting us, yeah. retired teachers of Ontario supporting this, this. Everyone that we have spoken to has gotten behind our referendum yeah. because this is a universal truth that people cherish our public health care system yes. because we feel it's like a, a, a health care system that, you know, that sets us apart from the Americans, allows us to deliver health care in a compassionate fashion, and to deliver health care based on needs, not based on someone's ability to pay. Yeah. And we, I think, as a society, uh, really believe in that notion. And uh, I, I hope that we can fight against this privatization. What you said about Canadians cherishing health care, uh, greatest Canadian was voted to be Tommy Douglas, who right. instituted a lot of um, the initial legislation that led to our uh, public health care system. Absolutely, and uh, I voted for Tom, Stomp and Tom Connors. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, I voted for Tommy. Uh, I didn't vote for Tommy. Uh, I, I don't think I voted. I think I voted for Terry Fox. <laughs> ah, okay, <laughs> but, yeah, uh, yeah. Anyway. Strong runner-up, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Still, uh, you're right. I mean, is you know what we've got with our Medicare system in Canada is absolutely absolutely needs to be protected and strengthened because if it's not, we're going to lose it. Yeah. And if Ontario loses Medicare, public health care, then the country may lose public yeah. health care. Because it's been, quote, unquote, proven to work in Ontario yeah. if, uh, if it comes yeah. to pass. So the, all the citizen grassroots groups are in favor of public health care and are, are supporting the uh, health coalition in uh, putting on this referendum. But it's not put on by Elections Ontario. It's not a, a government referendum. So Exactly. What happens when you present the results of this to the government? Well, I think they're going to be embarrassed. I think the government of Ontario is going to be shocked by the overwhelming uh, anti-privatization message that they're going to be seeing. And it's going to be very difficult for the government of Ontario to avoid it. I think that when we, when we announce the results of the referendum that uh, the media will pick it up. And importantly, I think the referendum is a really excellent vehicle to make the people across the region who are unaware of what was happening all of a sudden stand up and pay attention to what's happening and, have, and give them an opportunity to voice their displeasure. Yeah, that, that would be a positive outcome. Uh, my big fear is that the government will look at this and say, Thank you for your input and treat it as they've treated all the input from the opposition parties and uh, everybody else that's been contrary to the direction that they've taken and essentially ignoring it altogether. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Well, I think they, they, that, may, may, that may happen, but it's going to be very difficult for them to do this, and it's going to be also very difficult them, 
for them to get ongoing support for their privatization agenda when people start to really figure out what's happening here. When they start getting those massive bills, that medical mm -hmm. debt that we don't have in Canada. No, and well, we're starting to get it now. It's, yes, we're yeah. starting to get it now. I mean, uh, uh, Americans, uh, typically about 45% of all Americans, and remember there's 235 million of them, yeah. 45% of all Americans have a medical debt load of at least $10,000. Wow. Wow. You know, that's a lot of money to be carrying that you have to pay off. And 60% of all the bankruptcies in America are a direct result of health care costs. So when you have to make this amoral choice between the well-being of your loved ones, say your children or your wife or your husband or somebody in your family, or, or sell your house, to pay for the medical bills. Mm -hmm. That, I think, is amoral, and that's the state of the healthcare market driven, profit driven healthcare in America. I don't think Canadians want that. I'm convinced that Canadians do not want that. So, this may seem like a small step in privatization, but you know where we're going with this. You know, the one thing that Mr. Ford is correct about is how innovative these profit-driven private clinics will get yes. in terms of delivering you and me with a MasterCard or a Visa bill to go along with your OHIP card. Yeah, yeah. I'd much rather have my money spent on other public programs rather than going into the private health care coffers. Yeah. yeah, and again, <laughs> the thing that shocks me is that it's so much more expensive to do it this way with worse outcomes. Yeah. It just doesn't make any uh, sense from a health policy perspective or a fiscal perspective. Right. So why are we doing it? Uh, because it's profiting for somebody. Right. Yeah. So the uh, referendum is taking place on Friday, May 26th and Saturday, May 27th at various locations throughout Waterloo Region and throughout Ontario, in fact. Yeah. I'll uh, put that link to the map uh, and to some of the locations right in the uh, show notes, regiowaterloo.ca slash ccc. Um, and then go out and vote. Please. Because if you don't take political action, uh, health care will definitely suffer. This is your time to stand up for a public health care system. There is no other moment that's of such uh, import than, than this referendum on Friday and Saturday. Please help us to send a message to Mr. Ford. Yeah. Thank you, Jim Stewart. Thank you. For coming in yet again and talking to us about public health care in Ontario, uh, the lack of public health care, the privatization of public health care in Ontario. I hope I don't have to have you back on the show again. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> well, maybe we could come and talk about that new resilient public health care system that uh, we are going to invest in for the benefit of all Ontarians. Yeah, that, okay. that'd be good. All right. You've been listening to CKMS Community Connections on Radio Waterloo. CKMS Community Connections is sponsored by Radio Waterloo. Executive producer is Jennifer Strong. Associate producer is Jeff Steger. My name is Bob Jonkman. Our opening theme music and the theme music in the background was written by Steve Todd. CKMS Community Connections airs every Monday at 11 a.m. and alternate Fridays at 3 p.m. So I'll talk to you again next week. <laughs>